It's a four-step process. Okay. Historically, the rules of the Republican Party, uh, that's the actual name, the rules of the Republican Party, are adopted by one uh, national convention and go into effect at the end of that convention and remain in effect until the adjournment of the next following convention four years later. Okay. Uh, there is a committee of the RNC with one member from each state elected by the three members from each state called the Standing Committee on Rules. And that Standing Committee on Rules has a meeting every time the Republican National Committee meets, which is two or three times a year. And through the four-year period between conventions, the Standing Committee on Rules uh, considers uh, the existing rules uh, and uh, proposes amendments to the rules. The, uh, the week before the convention, Standing Committee on Rules makes its final, has its final meeting and then uh, its report goes to the Republican National Committee, which meets the following day. The Republican National Committee has the right to uh, accept its Standing Committee on Rules uh, recommendations or to amend them, and they can amend them in any way they want at the Republican National Committee level. Then, the day after that, the Convention Rules Committee meets. That is two delegates per state, a man and a woman, elected by the delegates from that state. Um, uh, the Standing Committee on Rules uh, meets for a day or two, or if necessary longer, and goes through all the rules again. And uh, it, it has in hand the report of the uh, Republican National Committee, but it can make amendments and uh, always does make some amendments. When the Convention uh, Rules Committee completes its report, that is then presented after the Convention convenes for consideration uh, by the entire National Convention, all of the delegates. And usually, in the vast majority of, of, of occasions, the Convention Rules Committee is uh, accepted uh, usually by unanimous vote um, by uh, all of the Convention delegates. So that's what the normal process has, has been. Okay. Now, there were a couple of controversial rule changes at the 2012 RNC this year. Um, More than a couple. Okay. Well, the ones that I was referring to are Rule 12 and Rule 16, which I'm familiar with because of the North Carolina delegation meetings over it. But um, when were, were those rule changes um, proposed at the standing committee meetings then? Absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. There has been some progress made over the years in making changes in the rules to make it easier for power to flow from the bottom up and to to some extent decentralizing uh, the, the Republican Party. Uh, for example, one of the uh, reforms which uh, I took part in passing a number of years ago was to have the Republican National Committee's Resolutions Committee um, elected with two members each from each of the four regions of, of the party. Prior to that, the Resolutions Committee had been just appointed by the National Party Chairman. So there, there had been progress made. Um, and there was more progress made in decentralizing the party. Um, in the Standing Committee on Rules that had met between the 2008 convention and the 2012 convention. When the Republican National Committee received the report of the Standing Committee, it unanimously adopted the uh, new set of rules uh, that had been proposed. 
So when we went to the meeting of the Convention Rules Committee, it was, was with considerable astonishment that uh, we saw a whole package of changes in the rules, all of which had the effect of uh, more and more centralizing the party. Mm -hmm. And all the progress, there were several amendments uh, to the rules that had been adopted by the Standing Committee on Rules and by the RNC, um, and all of them were repealed um, as the result of uh, activity organized um, uh, by uh, a member of the Convention Rules Committee from the District of Columbia, Ben Ginsburg. And they went further and came up with uh, other changes such as those that you refer to uh, in Rule 12 and the new uh, and the changes in what is now Rule 16. Mm -hmm. um, it, frankly, there were so many uh, surprise changes in, in, uh, that constituted actually a power grab or orchestrated by Ben Ginsburg that it, it wasn't practical for us to raise all of those issues in the battle because uh, right. the rules matter, matters, most people aren't uh, uh, expert in, and if we tried to argue on every single point, it, it, it wasn't practical. So um, the, there were uh, proposals for minority reports on, uh, on those uh, two amendments, but mm -hmm. there, there, there were others. Um, the, uh, the Ginsburg people backed away from uh, a change which they had got passed at the Convention Rules Committee because it was very clear that the sentiment was so strong that there would in fact be a sufficient number of the Convention Rules Committee signing a minority report which uh, would then have required a floor battle mm -hmm. during the course of the convention on national television. Um, and the principal onerous thing, which was uh, uh, in the rules at, but was taken out on uh, um, in, the, in the very final meeting, it was supposed to be a pro forma meeting of the convention rules committee held on the first uh, convention session on, on Tuesday, but it was such an awful power grab that um, uh, Ginsburg and others realized that they, they couldn't uh, continue with that, so they compromised it out. And this, this particular one was a rule that they proposed which said that national presidential candidates would have the power to disapprove and remove delegates who had been properly elected through the state uh, procedures by state party rule or state law. And that was truly outrageous because mm -hmm. all the delegates of the convention uh, were elected through um, adherence to state party rules and, and state laws um, and this would have called into question the, the legitimacy of delegates so, ele so elected in future conventions. So they backed off from that okay. and, and so now uh, we are back to the previous uh, situation where a, uh, a duly elected delegate, even if his delegate vote has uh, been committed to a particular candidate uh, by state party rules or state law uh, and, and that candidate doesn't like him, that person who was duly elected will remain as uh, a delegate. It was always clear that if a delegate tried to, whose vote was bound by state party rules or state law, tried to not cast his vote as state party rules or state law required, that that uh, that vote would not be allowed to be cast, um, and the the the, the so-called compromise wrote into the rules 
that the secretary of the national convention, if some delegate um, breaks the rules, is required to record the vote as state rules or state party law required. But the person elected a delegate is free to be a delegate and to be and to act uh, in whatever way that delegate uh, chooses to do. Um, uh, even if it doesn't comport with the ideas of a particular presidential candidate. It was truly outrageous, this change in the rules, and, and they would, uh, that change, if adopted, I am confident, would have resulted in many, many duly elected delegates being removed mm -hmm. and being replaced by people who had made large financial contributions uh, to a particular presidential candidate. Um, which is quite the opposite of the way things should run, where the people at the grassroots should have the right to elect uh, their, their delegates and have those delegates serve. Yeah, now the Romney campaign has taken a lot of heat from uh, the grassroots over these proposals of the rule changes. Um, do you, you bet uh, they have taken heat, and the heat began on the floor of the Convention Rules Committee mm -hmm. by, um, by me. Mm -hmm. uh, you might find it interesting, and I have available and give to you a copy of the transcript of the Convention Rules Committee. Oh, yes. And you will, and you will see uh, in it that I warned them. I warned Ginsburg by name. I told them that they were damaging the uh, prospects for election of mm -hmm. Mitt Romney, who was going to be nominated at the convention, and I warned them repeatedly and emphatically. Um, and subsequently, I sent uh, during the convention uh, two uh, emails to the convention delegates, all those for whom I could get mm -hmm. good email addresses, and I mailed another email to the delegates after the convention to summarize what, is, what has happened. And if you don't have those, the three letters I wrote. Uh, um, they are, uh, I believe, all available uh, currently on my uh, um, diary on the conservative website Red, Red State. Okay. Uh, and, and those three letters were there, and they were strongly worded, and were, uh, and and uh, and they went viral. I'm sure that they mm -hmm. went to millions of, of people, and I'm glad they did. Yeah. There was a final supposedly perfunctory meeting of the Convention Rules Committee that convened after the, con the, the session began. And it was there, uh, in order to prevent a minority report, that Ben Ginsburg and his people um, agreed to take out that uh, uh, change mm -hmm. which they had put into the rules that would allow presidential candidates to remove delegates. So. Um, and that was the, to be the final vote, but it was uh, ordinarily that is simply we all meet uh, together and, uh, and, and vote for what has already been previously adopted the, mm -hmm. the, at, toward the end of the previous week. Uh, it is customary uh, in the Republican Party particularly, and I know a whole lot more about the Republican Party operations than the Democrats, but it is customary for whoever is the Republican uh, leader in the House, if we have a, a Republican majority, the Speaker of the House becomes mm -hmm. uh, the Chairman of the National Convention. And if we don't have a Republican Speaker, then the Republican minority leader of the House chairs the convention. Well, have you seen this video that has come out where uh, during John Boehner's time of chairing the convention and uh, he called to vote by the delegates the adoption of the Rules Committee report, um, where basically it was very clear in the audio that uh, the delegates' votes, the no's, they either had it or it was a very close tie, and yet he called that the eyes had it, had the vote. Yeah. And later, a video came out that showed that the uh, vote was on a teleprompter. Right. Was that coordinated, do you think, with Ginsburg or...? Um... No, it, it, um, I know a lot of people were upset. There were people on the floor of the convention who, if they turned around, um, they could see uh, the teleprompter, which is uh, put there to be visible by the 
uh, whoever is is uh, speaking at the time. Mm -hmm. There's been a universal practice, probably uh, instituted shortly uh, after television technology uh, uh, came out, for there to be a script of the entire convention written before the convention begins. And it's put on that teleprompter so that uh, procedurally uh, everything goes in the right order and that you know, people don't forget to do things which are necessary to, to be done. Um, those scripts uh, are never exactly followed. Uh, there is no legal requirement that the, whoever is speaking read from the script. And when something unexpected happens, the speaker is on his own or on her own. And so it, virtually everybody at the convention, myself included, expected that the voice vote on the adoption of the rules was going to um, be in favor of adoption of the rules. Um, Never, as far as I know, has there been a negative vote, uh, that is a defeat of the, com of the Rules Committee report. But by then, people were so upset um, about the power grab and about uh, thing issues particularly which had been raised regarding Rule 12 and Rule 16 that there was a lot of negative vote. Um, where I was seated, which was there um, in, in the, the, the second row, Virginia being a, a, uh, a battle line state, they gave us really good seats. They had us right there um, um, beneath the stage. Uh, and I couldn't tell for sure which side was louder. Mm -hmm. the people in Virginia, we were uh, voting unanimously, as far as I know, against it. So it was obviously louder in my vicinity, but it was very, and it sounded differently in different parts mm -hmm. of the convention uh, floor. Um, the, by the way, I have seen or heard suggestions that somehow the Ron Paul people packed the galleries and people in the galleries were participating improperly in the mm. voice votes where only delegates should have voted. Um, that is preposterous. Um, in the first place, uh, there was absolutely no way for the Ron Paul forces to pack the galleries. The delegate passes were handed yeah. out to the various state delegations and there were a number of Ron Paul delegates there. They didn't have any um, superior access to those guest tickets. That was, that was just preposterous. But the vote was uh, uh, in doubt, and Boehner called it um, uh, that the eyes had it, which was what was read on the screen. Right. Um, there's no way of telling what the vote would have been had there been a roll call vote on adoption of the rules. I tend to think it would have, uh, the rules would have passed had there been a roll call vote. Yeah. So, and, and there's, but there was nothing sinister about having uh, the words the eyes right. have put put it put, was put, just uh, kind uh, put, put on there. It could have been obviously other the other way. Yeah. Clearly obviously the other way. Banner would have had to say the nose have it. And then there would have been a lot of scratching of heads. What do we do now? Yeah, I wasn't sure um if you were at the RNC at the time of the rules vote because um there were some issues with the buses that day. Right. That was at that was uh, the first uh, full session of the mm -hmm. convention. There was a perfunctory session where it was called to order and then adjourned on Monday. And I actually went from my hotel 29 miles to be there for that perfunctory session. But the next day, um, um, where actually all the delegates were supposed to come, Louisiana uh, and Rhode Island shared a bus, um, and that bus was delayed by hours. Uh, and as a result, um, the convention was called to session. It was announced that members of the convention committee should recess, uh, should uh, should leave, and go to designated rooms in, uh, around the periphery of the convention hall to complete 
their business. And so the resolutions committee and the rules committee and other committees went out to those uh, meetings. But the, whole, the entire Virginia delegation and the Rhode Island delegation were in a bus. And um, we hadn't gotten there yet. And since I had been leading uh, the battle against this power grab, there were a lot of people at that meeting who looked around and said, where's Morton Blackwell? Uh -huh. um, and there were, uh, uh, I was talking to people um, uh, by cell phone from the bus, and uh, uh, it was a catastrophic situation. And we, when we got to the city, uh, from we were at Clearwater Beach, our delegate, our delegation, 29 miles away. When we got into the city, uh, it still would have been possible for us to um, be dropped off at the convention hall, but uh, the bus driver. Uh, was directed by police people to go this way and that way, and we went around uh, this one several block loop three times. Once we uh, went part way around the loop and then went out of away from the convention hall for some distance, and then turned around and came back, and came back. The suggestion has been made that it was somehow a deliberate attempt to keep me from being at that final meeting. Um, of the Convention Rules Committee. Um, I never for a minute believed that this was deliberate. And the evidence is overwhelming that the bus ar arrangements for uh, convention delegates was particularly on that day Tuesday absolutely catastrophic. There were other delegations that mm -hmm. didn't make it uh, to the convention hall um, until after the convention committees had, had 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 their meetings and adjourned. That night, it was mass chaos at the end of the Tuesday session. Um, there were some delegations that did not get back to their hotels until 3.45 a.m. The, yeah. the, the transportation arrangements, particularly on the first day, were, were really awful uh, and were somewhat improved uh, Afterwards, there was not anything quite as bad uh, in the final days of the convention. Uh, but Tuesday was awful, and um, it it, uh, it goes beyond uh, what I would believe to suggest that somehow all of that day of chaos was somehow contrived for the single purpose of trying to get me to go <laughs> to that to that uh, convention rules committee meeting where. In, in point of fact, um, the compromise had already been made, and the and the provision that allowed presidential candidates to remove duly elected delegates was uh, was was going to be removed. And I don't think we had the votes uh, there. I'm confident that we didn't have the votes to reverse anything that had been done uh, the, the previous week because the power grab had been effective to that point. Now, on the day of the. Uh, those bus issues. Actually, North Carolina had some issues of our own in which um, the we were um, at a delegation hotel with the Minnesota delegation and the RNC uh, had sent, I think, two buses and so that was enough to get North Carolina's delegation and uh, a good portion of Minnesota's, but not the entire delegation, just the main uh, delegates the, right. and the alternates similar, and guests. It was a similar thing. It, uh, the first bus that left our hotel in Clearwater Beach mm -hmm. um, uh, was limited to just delegates because they, they, not all the delegates and all the alternates. Uh, they wanted to make sure they were there. The delegates were the ones who had the vote, right. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I was uh, waiting, we waited for probably about an hour, the alternates and guests of North Carolina and then a lot of the um, Minnesotans as well. <laughs> in the hotel uh, before we were really kind of starting to panic, going, oh my goodness, is, are the buses coming? And I asked um, an administrative official there, and I wish I had gotten her name now, but uh, she was making some calls, trying to figure out what was going on with the buses, if they were on their way, and uh, told me after she had gotten off the phone and some things that our chairman, uh, Robin Hayes, had reported to the RNC that we only needed them to send transportation for 25% of our registered delegation. 
And so I'm still very puzzled. I have not had the opportunity to ask him what the situation was with that, but to me, it seems like that was pretty deliberate. I can't understand why, you know, that would have been reported, but... Um, well, um, I, I, this is the first I, I heard of uh, problems in North Carolina. I heard problems about many states with, with that transportation disaster on, the, on that uh, Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, our delegates I, I were there I can't, I can't, on time. Uh, I can't, uh, I can't right. uh, speak to I, that. I, I really can't, can't speak to that. And, and uh, in order to speak to that, somebody would have to think what would have been the motive mm -hmm. of not wanting anybody but the delegates to get there. And I, I don't, can't conceive of what the motive would have been right. uh, to do that. Now, you met our chairman. I don't know if you had um, interaction with him prior to the we, 2012. We're acquainted. We've been acquainted mm -hmm. a long time. Yeah, okay. You, uh, I, I don't think he, uh, he has been as active as long as I, because in 1964, I was Barry Goldwater's youngest delegate in the nation. <laughs> I've been to all the conventions since then. But, but uh, Robin Hayes is, a, 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 of course, a veteran Republican in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Um, you were present at a meeting of the North Carolina delegation. Yep, one, in of, the, which one of the delegates invited me to, mm -hmm. to come, and I accepted. Right, to, they to, had to seen your about, emails about, about the, about the minority report, yeah. mm -hmm. and they uh, we were we had scheduled I think it was a three forty five meeting of our delegation specifically to discuss the rule changes and how North Carolina was going to um, address them at the RNC and kind of what our stance was on it and just get more information about it. And so uh, some of the delegates wanted to invite you because uh, you had the proposed minority report. You're a senior member of the uh, Standing Rules Committee. And so we wanted to get your input. And Chairman Hayes didn't, was, didn't seem too happy to have you there, in my opinion. <laughs> um, and he at one point asked you to leave and after you left he um, asked, you know, or he was saying that he didn't know who invited you and things like that, which is, um, that video's kind of made some waves in North Carolina because... Yeah, it circulated around the country <laughs> that, uh, uh, and, and I kind of enjoyed watching because the video continued after I left. Um, oh, yeah. He, he, he originally, as I recall, uh, told me I could have only two minutes. Well, two minutes to discuss a matter as complex as the rules wasn't going to be sufficient. And I, as I began, I said, I, I'm happy to talk, but it's going to take longer than that. And uh, uh, there were still people who wanted to ask questions after I finished, but mm -hmm. I was there for, for a decent interval of time. And he, treat, he treated me somewhat respectfully, but uh, he was obviously arguing the, the, the other side. Uh, right. And uh, the thing that I most remember is his telling uh, the North Carolina delegation that they had to support uh, the Convention Rules Committee because this was a leadership decision. Um, yeah, he kept saying, support your leadership, the leadership wants this. And at one point, at the end, when he was asking us to vote on, you know, how we felt about the rule changes, he even said uh, something to the effect of Mitt Romney did not want us to not support the rule changes. and. You know, whether that's true or not is up to question. Well, it is clear that Ben Ginsburg of the District of Columbia mm -hmm. uh, represented himself as the Romney representative on the Rules Committee, oh. and I, I'm confident that was the case. Um, but they were, it, 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 it was a terrible mistake, a terrible mistake, um, and was. Um, not what was needed. Right. There was no um, benefit in the 2012 November election to be had from making any of these rules changes um, because the operation under the rules um, um, was not going to have its impact uh, until the 2016 convention. And there were many people, uh, and I think it, it generally within the Republican Party, most people, favor to the extent possible and practical 
to have the power in the Republican Party flowing from the bottom up rather than mm -hmm. from the top down. And this whole series of changes uh, that, that they made um, was uh, absolutely certain to run counter to the instincts and, and, uh, and preferences, and in many cases, firm political philosophy of those of us in the Republican Party who, who believe that a top-down centralized party um, is, is not uh, what the Republican Party ought to be. So I considered this to be a terrible blunder mm -hmm. and said it repeatedly uh, at, at the time th that it was a blunder. Uh, and I have no doubt that this m uh, move to make it uh, um, more difficult for young people, for, for, for rather for new people, to become active in the party and have an impact on the party um, uh, caused a whole lot of people to think about maybe not voting for the Republican nominee. That's what I was afraid of, and I right. said it uh, on the floor of the Convention Rules Committee, and I said it firmly, and I said it repeatedly, uh, and I knew it was the case, and the fact that uh, um, when the, my comments uh, became public knowledge, that it suddenly became viral, and, uh, and and many many different websites and bloggers took my stuff and forwarded it on and forwarded it on and forwarded it on, indicates that that I was right about this, um, and I, I tell you my my firm hope is that we can reverse this damage mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and go back to our gradual process of opening up the party at the bottom. There's no question but that the Republican National Committee itself has to be, to a significant extent, centralized. The RNC meets, as I said, two or three times a week, a, a, a year. There are 168 members. There's a fairly rapid turnover. It's unusual for somebody uh, to serve as long as I have on, on the National Committee. State chairmen uh, have a tendency to have to be in the state chairmanship for relatively brief periods of time. And not many members, the National Committee men and committee women, uh, have, have any desire to stay on for a long time. I've stayed on and active and keep a strong base in the Virginia Republican Party in large part because I have this keen interest in the rules, this project of keeping the party open at the bottom, um, because I think that's how uh, conservative principles can triumph in this country, is the grassroots uh, conservatives are going to do things, um, um, and the party will do better things if the grassroots pressure is there to stop them from, uh, at the top, from, from um, diverging from conservative principles. So, I stayed, I've stayed active in it, uh, and I intend to stay active in it, and I was re-elected uh, to, to another four-year term, and we will shortly have uh, a meeting of the state party chairman and the national committee woman uh, of Virginia and I, and they will, the three of us will elect me to serve on the standing committee on rules, and I'll serve until uh, the 2016 convention, so I'm, I'm still around. Um, and I think that this battle has brought into more people's consciousness the importance of the rules, mm -hmm. and I think it's entirely likely that there will be much more effort in 2016 to elect solid and principled conservatives um, to the convention uh, rules committee. Conservatives uh, for generations have had the greatest interest in serving as as uh, in serving their state as being a member of the resolutions committee which writes the platform mm -hmm. uh, and so that's a real plum and in many cases people get the rules committee because it's an office that has to be filled and somebody on the spur of the moment will volunteer to take that position it makes them a uh, it gives you a little extra thing to put on your uh, 
ceremonial pin at the, con at, at the convention. Um, but I think there's going to be mu much more interest in having good conservatives who are committed not only to limited government in the sense of federal, state, and local government, but also uh, um, limitations on the centralization of power within the Republican Party structure itself. Mm -hmm. that, that, that is important. Um, uh, I expected that there would be uh, su significant questions uh, raised in other people's minds by what I did. I, I truly had no idea that it would become as, as big an issue uh, as it did, but I don't doubt, I don't, uh, um, uh, for a minute, uh, regret uh, carrying on this fight, and I intend to keep active in this fight, and Lord willing, I'll be there in 2016 at the convention fighting for these same principles. Have the actions of the RNC and the way that things played out changed your outlook on Mitt Romney's campaign and potentially his administration? Because you were a Romney delegate. Actually, actually um, I, I, I did not endorse any candidate for the Republican nomination for president this year until there was only one. Uh -huh. um, the uh, and this is the first time in a national nominating contest that I have not. And 2012 was an, an exceptional uh, period for me um, because uh, there were at the outset lots of candidates, a number of them strong conservatives, and a number of them longtime friends of mine. Uh, and if there had been some philosophical imperative to go with one of them, I certainly would have. But uh, what I do uh, as president of the Leadership Institute, my educational foundation, is to recruit conservatives and teach them how to be effective in government and in politics and the media. And from the very outset, a lot of the uh, conservatives, many of them younger conservatives, uh, who were coming to our training programs were supporting all these various candidates. And uh, uh, if I had endorsed one of those candidates in the nomination process, that would have been a reason for conservatives who were supporting other candidates, conservatives or libertarians mm -hmm. who were supporting other candidates, uh, to stop coming to my training programs, which I thought was, were doing a great uh, deal of work, and we did a lot of work, for example, in North Carolina. Oh yeah, I went uh, to uh, at least one of them. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, we had uh, well over a dozen grassroots training programs in North Carolina uh, in the run-up to the 2012 elections. And, and so uh, I, I decided that since there wasn't any overwhelming reason to uh, endorse a candidate this time that I wouldn't. And the, uh, the state law and party rules in Virginia allocated the delegates elected at the congressional district conventions and the delegates at large elected at the state convention depending upon the primary results. But it didn't bind the three members of the National Committee from Virginia to vote for any oh, particular okay. candidate. So I wasn't a bound delegate to anybody. I decided um, to support uh, Romney and support him heavily mm -hmm. uh, after he picked Paul Ryan as his running, running mate. And as I said in my letters to, to the delegates, um, my wife and I gave more contributions to uh, Romney Victory, Inc. by a multiple of several times more than we had ever given to any other candidate uh, running for office. And my wife and I have been married for 40 years. I mean, this, this everything 
on the line in this election. Right. Barack Obama is a leftist ideologue, and he does danger. He does dangerous things and harmful things, and the people he has brought into government do dangerous and harmful things. Um, and uh, um, there was no question that any of the Republican candidates for the nomination would have been better for the country uh, than uh, Barack Obama. Yeah. Back to the North Carolina delegation meeting. With the North Carolina delegation, we were pretty surprised when we went into that meeting because we had a breakfast meeting that day in which it seemed like uh, you know, our committee woman, our uh, speaker of the state house, were definitely spoke out in favor of the minority report and things like that, and against the rule changes. They said it was a grab of power from the grassroots. Um, it seemed like the entire room of the delegation was in support of the minority report. And then when we walked into the um, meeting later that day, our chairman Hayes, well, our committee woman wasn't at the meeting. Um, it has been said that she was still at the RNC from earlier that day. Um, our Speaker of the House had nothing to say at that meeting, and our Chairman Hayes immediately says that he it's his intention to have the delegation vote in favor of the rule changes and things like that. Right. Do you know or do you think that somebody spoke to him in between that period of time of the two meetings um, and bent his ear? Are you familiar with anything like that happening? I, I, I have no knowledge of any communications uh, that, that went to the chairman of your delegation, mm -hmm. um, but I uh, am prepared to bet that there were communications to the chairman of, of all the delegations uh, where Ben Ginsburg and the people who were running the rules operation uh, at that national convention for the Romney campaign, uh, they would have contacted them all. There, there was a, uh, a prairie fire of, of opposition to these power grabs, right. which made, no, it made the, the changes made no sense politically. I mean, if, uh, if, if, if Romney, and everybody could understand that if Romney were elected president, he wasn't going to have any trouble with the Republican Party when running for re-election. Uh, it, 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 it was under, there was no danger there, but it was as if there was an uh, an instinct of some people there. I mean, I have I, I I would rather doubt that anybody ever went up to Mitt Romney and said, "Now we have got to centralize the rules of the Republican Party in this way, this way, this way, this way." I, I think that some of the people who had uh, who were part of his campaign, who were assigned the matter of rules, decided that, well, there are the ways that we could tighten our control. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that's what happened. So, but, but I don't have any knowledge of, of what the communications were. I will tell you this, that uh, the chairman of the Virginia delegation, uh, Pat Mullins, um, who was in receipt of the communications from the Romney campaign, was told uh, either that either uh, uh, either either Wednesday or Thursday morning, I believe it may have been. It could have been Friday morning. It was one of the mornings. We too, like North Carolina, we had a delegation meeting every morning, and uh, and our chairman was told by the uh, uh, the Romney forces that. The, they were sending a representative to speak before the Virginia delegation, and that the representative was going to be Ben Ginsburg. Yeah. And uh, um, Chairman Mullins, as he told it to me later, he's a, a, a wonderful guy and a dear friend of mine. He, he uh, in essence, explained it to him that it wasn't going to be in Mitt Romney's interest to have Ben Ginsburg, who was behind this paragraph, to come address our delegation, which was unanimously and openly uh, and repeatedly uh, voting uh, to support me in my rule uh, uh, battle. I mean, mm -hmm. it was, there was real enthusiasm. And as it turned out, Ben Ginsburg didn't come to the Virginia delegation. Uh, Henry Barber, who is the nephew of former Mississippi Governor Haley Barber, 
uh, was uh, one of Mississippi's two delegates uh, on the Convention Rules Committee. And when I made my initial talk in opposition to this terrible rule that would have allowed presidential candidates to remove delegates who'd been duly elected under state law, um, that struck a responsive chord with Haley, and he stood up and strongly supported what I had to say. I'm wow. sure the transcript will show that. Good. Um, but then, uh, Ben Ginsburg, who was seated very close to me, um, toward the back of the hall, um, and others moved over there and briefly surrounded Henry Barber, and subsequently Henry Barber uh, um, wound up supporting uh, an amendment um, which what was only cosmetic and didn't eliminate uh, the problem. Uh, the, the original resolution um, said that the presidential candidate um, had the power to remove delegates, and the amendment was that the presidential candidate had the power to remove delegates after consultation with the state parties. Oh, yeah. uh, well, that didn't give the state parties any right to veto it, and so Henry then supported that uh, a, a, a amendment, and uh, that amendment was adopted, but fortunately the whole um, uh, concept was later thrown out because they had to throw it out or there was going to be a convention floor fight. A lot of the young folks, a lot of my friends that were at the RNC or watching from home um, had in their minds that, you know, they might vote for Mitt Romney, they were Ron Paul um, fans and things like that, but that they might end up voting for Mitt Romney, they were going to watch and see how things progress at the RNC and things like that. And then seeing the events of the RNC with the main delegates being um, decredentialed and then with the rule changes and things like that really it just put a bad taste in their mouth for Mitt Romney like you were you know kind of afraid that um, people Romney was going to take the brunt of these rule changes and things like that did um, yeah, I, wasn't, I wasn't afraid I believed it yeah I knew it right. to be, I knew it to be a fact and I said it while there was still time for them to withdraw this power grab 